Hi, how are you doing? We're gonna go full anatomy nerd. Uh, we've looked at the skull a lot, but we're gonna go inside the skull. We're gonna look at the floor of the cranial cavity on the inside, and we're gonna look at all of the little lumps and bumps and shapes and pretty much everything that's got a name and name it and talk about it a little bit. We've already talked about the foramina, um, but I'll point at these as we go along. Um, and we'll talk about the anterior, middle, and posterior cranial fossae. All right, um, I've got a better quality, no offense, I've got a better quality skull than yours, which I'll use. So, um, take off the, the top, the calvarium, the skull cap, and we're, we're going in there. So this is anterior, this is posterior, this is the frontal bone, this is the occipital bone, we've got parietal bones up here, the temporal bones over there, and in the middle here we've got the ethmoid bone and the sphenoid bone, and these are the bones that we're gonna be looking at, it's these little lumps and bumps which we're interested in. And when we talk about the cranial fossae, so each cranial fossa, on the left and the right, we have an anterior cranial fossa, so that bit, a middle cranial fossa, so that bit, and a posterior cranial fossa, that bit. The, when you look at 2D illustrations, the thing that gets lost here is that the anterior cranial fossa is more superior, it's up here, uh, and then the posterior cranial fossa is actually quite low down, that's where the cerebellum is. So there's, some, there's a three-dimensional aspect to it, superior and inferior, as well as anterior and posterior, Ooh, as if this video wasn't gonna be complex enough already. But we're starting up against the frontal bone and we can see this ridge in here. So this ridge here in the midline of the frontal bone inside the cranial cavity is the frontal crest. And it continues and becomes this notable midline crest here, the Christa galli. Christa galli, um, the cox, the roost, you know, the, the crest that a rooster's got. And when we're seeing ridges like this, we're often seeing attachments of the dura mater, the dura mater, the connective tissue that's supporting the brain and compartmentalizing the brain, if you like. Uh, so the crista galli is where the, the falc cerebri separating the two cerebral hemispheres attaches anteriorly. And what we're looking at there at the crista galli um, is we're looking at the ethmoid bone. We can see the cribriform plate. Cribriform describes a sieve-like structure. So we, we're seeing two depressions there on either side of the crista galli. That's where the left and right olfactory bulbs sit, cranial nerves one, and they send their neurons through the cribriform plate into the, the nasal cavity uh, for smell detection. This is the frontal bone superior to each orbit, so these are the orbital parts of the frontal bone. The bone here is very thin. Um, when we're dissecting cadavers, if we want to dissect the orbit, we will go through here, we'll chip away at the bone, uh, and that'll give us access to the, the orbit, the depth of the orbit, so we can look at the bits in there. So the orbital parts of the frontal bone. Can you see at the anterior end of the crista galli, there is a foramen, what looks like a foramen. This is the foramen cecum. Cecum, we see the word cecum elsewhere in the body. Cecum refers to a, a blind ending pit, a cul-de-sac. So that foramen cecum doesn't actually go anywhere, but um, that's a, a notable bony structure there. So in the anterior cranial fossa, and we can see the edge of it here because we've got a, a clear drop off. In the anterior cranial fossa, we've been looking at the frontal bone, and the ethmoid bone. The other bone in here is the sphenoid bone. Sphenoid um, comes from a couple of Greek words and it means wedge-shaped, which probably isn't terribly helpful. I think we often try to think of the sphenoid bone as butterfly-shaped. So it has wings, it, it, it spreads out this away. So in the anterior cranial fossa, we find the body of the sphenoid bone and the lesser wings of the sphenoid bone, one on either side. And right at the edge here, so these two processes sticking out here are the clenoid processes. So we have these two anterior clenoid processes uh, and we have medial clenoid processes. Uh, clenoid comes from 
Greek words meaning well, bed shaped. So I, I, I'm thinking of a four poster bed and the clinoid post processes being the posts of that poster bed because we also have these posterior clinoid processes here which we'll get to in a moment. Now the anterior clinoid processes are part of the sphenoid bone and as we move posteriorly we're moving from the anterior cranial fossa into the middle cranial fossa. Um, and <laughs> to confuse my four poster bed analogy, those anterior clinoid processes are matched with posterior clinoid processes, but we also have middle clinoid processes, which kind of muddies things up a little bit. Um, but the most notable feature here that we get to, I think, possibly, um, is the cella tersica, the Turkish saddle. And the whole bony depression there is the cella tersica, and the deepest part which holds the pituitary glands, the hypophysis, is the hypophyseal fossa, the deepest part, because there, there is duramator covering over this and leaving a hole for the pituitary stalk. Um, so these bony processes that we're seeing here uh, are attachment sites again for duramater. So if we look really carefully, in the anterior part of the cella tersica, so the anterior edge of the hypophyseal fossa, we have the tuberculum celli, the tubercle of the cella, the tubercle of the cella tersica, the, tu the, tu <laughs> the tubercle of the sal sal salad, the tubercle of the saddle is there. So it's the name for that lump. Then either side of the tuberculum celli are the middle clinoid processes. And then just anterior to all that, there's a little bit of a sulcus that maybe I can imagine I can, I can feel. The chiasmatic sulcus sits in there. So the, the chiasm, the optic chiasm, the two optic nerves are crossing over uh, as they pass superior to the pituitary gland. That uh, leaves a little shape on the bone there. And then as we get to the posterior part, of the cella tersica, we have the dorsum celli, the back of the saddle. We have the posterior clinoid processes on either side. And then we have a slope leading away. The slope is the, is the clevis, meaning slope. Uh, and that slope then is what the basilar artery is up against, what the brainstem is up against. So there are quite a lot of little bony, bony shapes there. Now those posterior clinoid processes, um, the tentorium cerebelli, the, the tent of duramater that sits between the cerebellum and the cerebrum, that's its attachment point. So that uh, indicates the boundary between the anterior, sorry, between the middle and the posterior um, cranial fossae. So we're now in the middle cranial fossa and the sphenoid bone is making up the central parts and we're looking at the, the greater wing of the sphenoid bone here on either side. Um, the temporal bone is forming much of the floor of the middle cranial fossa and the parietal bone is out here laterally. There are a number of foramina here, which we've looked at before and we'll look at in more detail in another video. So there's the optic canal for the optic nerve uh, is popping out here. We have the superior orbital fissure. We've got the foramen ovale. We've got foramen spinosum next to it. And then we've got foramen lacerum, which is actually um, a cartilaginous joint between the bones that are meeting here. Um, oh, and foramen rotundum in there. Um, these are generally taking branches of the cranial nerves two different parts of the face or the neck. Oh, and um, the carotid canal, of course. The internal carotid artery is responsible for the carotid canal. It's also responsible for that groove that we see in the floor of the middle cranial fossa there medially, and also responsible for that curve that the anterior clinoid processes curve around. Those curves are there because there is a major blood vessel there and the soft tissues form with the hard tissues, which is what gives us all of these shapes. Now the 
The bony edge that we see here, so we've already dropped off from the anterior cranial fossa, we've dropped down to the middle cranial fossa. This bony edge here is going to drop us off down into the posterior cranial fossa. And this bony edge, this is uh, part of the temporal bone, and it's the petrous part of the temporal bone, me petrous meaning rocky, this is like a rocky ridge here. And in there are the structures of the middle ear and the inner ear. And there is a there's kind of a, a domed shape here. This, this curve, this dome shape, this is the arcuate eminence. And under there are the semicircular canals, the structures of the, the inner ear. And as we run a little bit anteriorly, uh, here is the tegmen tympani. That's the roof of the middle ear cavity. If I look very carefully next to these uh, foramen here, I can see a groove passing towards um, the oval foramen. This is the groove for the lesser petrosal nerve. And I can see a groove running towards foramen lacerum. And that's the groove for the greater petrosal nerve. The other grooves that we can see in the floor of the middle cranial fossa are extending from foramen spinosum. And these are branches of the middle meningeal artery which has come from the maxillary artery through foramen spinosum and then runs between the bone and the dura mater supplying blood there. When we move into the posterior cranial fossa, we've got some very big grooves. Um, we go down the slope, we go down the clevis here, there is a tubercle on either side. So this is a jugular tubercle right next to the jugular foramen. And from the jugular foramen, uh, that's where the internal jugular vein is going to start. Cranial nerves 9, 10, 11 go through there as well. Um, so the, the dural venous sinuses are coming together here to drain blood out of the cranial cavity through the internal jugular vein. So there's a groove, uh, it's quite a marked groove running down here, which is the groove for the inferior petrosal sinus. Remember, this is the petrous part of the temporal bone. Um, into the Petrous temporal bone, we can also see the internal acoustic meatus, which cranial nerves seven and eight are going into. And we've got some quite big grooves. We've got a groove coming around here, which is the groove for the sigmoid sinus. We've got a groove here. So now we're getting to the occipital bone back here. So we have a, a transverse groove, a groove for the transverse sinus. And we've got the internal occipital protuberance here. But these grooves of the transverse sinus, sigmoid sinus, inferior petrosal sinus, they're all leading towards where the inferior, or where the internal jugular vein is going to start. And then as we get to the very back of the head, um, occipital comes from the Latin word meaning the back of the head. <laughs> um, that internal occipital protuberance and that internal occipital crest there again shows attachment sites for the dura mater. Um, so we've got the falx cerebri and the falx cerebelli in the midline separating the left and right sides of the cerebral hemispheres and the cerebellum. The big hole of course is foramen magnum and we have a little hole in the occipital condyle down there which is the hypoglossal canal for the hypoglossal nerve. Um, and that's about it. Well, I'll say that's it. I probably missed something. But those are the bony features of the floor of the cranial cavity. We're going from the frontal bone and the ethmoid bone through the sphenoid bone to the temporal bones and the occipital bone. And they're all kind of meeting in the middle at the sphenoid bone to a certain extent. Um, these ridges that we see are where dura mater attach. Uh, often these little lumpy bits are as well, so the dura mater forms a number of structures to help support the soft tissues inside the cranial cavity. Where we see foramen, we see cranial nerves and blood vessels passing through, usually foramen lacerum is a little bit different because it's a cartilaginous joint. If you want to know more about the foramen, search for that video on my channel, or it's probably even in this same playlist, right? Um, but we can see how that anterior cranial fossa
then drops off to the middle cranial fossa, which then drops off to the posterior cranial fossa. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about those regions of the cranial cavity. Um, all right, so there's, there's, there's quite a lot in there. Um, I bet we can still find more to talk about with the skull, but we've covered most things. Okay, cranial cavity. Well, I hope that was interesting. See you next week.